Welcome to the Trailhead, where trails start and stories unfold. Welcome to the show, everyone. Now here's JD. This has been hectic. You retiring? When are you retiring? Oh, so I'll be wrapping up my last duty station here within the next week and a half. And then uh, for the following six months, I'll be just working on all my medical and all my processing to uh, retire. Nice. Yeah. And how many years of service? 28 years and a few months. Damn. Well, thank you very much, sir. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been a long road. You... It's been a long road. I that's a long time to spend in the service, man. Has that been your like your full time thing, right? Yeah. Yep. And uh, is this past couple of years have been the uh, the uh, only time that I've really been able to really get into the off roading like I really wanted to and get out and see some of the events and yeah. Now it's like I can't I can't deal without Trail Hero. I have to be there. <laughs> I think p part of the appeal for me to try to find some sort of uh, stable retirement is the main purpose. So I just don't, I can get out whenever I want to go. Well, no, not much. You just went home. Uh, Halloween was busy. So like today and <laughs> I went just like, trying to chill, take a chill. Uh, nice. We have a, a small GP event that people do here <laughs> in Washington. Um, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, next week. So I think we're gonna be preparing for that during the weekend. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah, we call it King of Elby. <laughs> King of Elby. Yep. yep. Is there a reason for that? Well, like King of Hammers, I guess that's why because they're doing races. Okay, so there's not something like he's. I felt like Jason was saying like there was something tongue in cheek and funny about it. Well, it's uh, uh I mean, yeah, they get the name from King of Hammers, but it's. It's a, it's literally just a big, massive gathering and watching. For the most part, it's built up um, buggies and uh, Toyotas, and they just fly up over this one obstacle um, boat ramp, they call it. And like, we just posted a video on mine, and I think we put on there, what, can I do it in a minute? Um, that was kind of a joke, an inside joke. I think I spent what thirty minutes on that damn thing, <laughs> and it was. It's just uh It's really wet, muddy, and the rocks and boulders are perfectly placed to just make it yeah really difficult. When you look at it, it in person, it looks intimidating. On video, it looks like it's nothing, and a lot of people will comment and say, "Well, that doesn't literally look like too much." But when you're there, yeah, it, I. I don't dare to put my gladiator in there yet. I want it to, but yeah. There's there's no Fair um, enough. There's no line on that thing that's like, okay, I'm gonna show you some technique. No, it's just hammer down and when it grabs, it grabs and goes and you better be able to hang on. And they make a big event out of it and it's 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 a blast. They put a big old timer up above the whole run. And the person that makes it through this course with the fastest run wins. And it's no, they have a time limit too. Well, no, they, they have a time limit, but whoever can make it the fastest wins. Yeah. But it's it's a good time. Yeah, most people that go straight breaks. Yeah, we'll definitely we'll definitely get some content from it. Yeah. I mean we're not gonna race, we're gonna watch other people race, but like we like to go because it's like uh before the event we go off roading and it's off roading in the morning and the afternoon and night runs. And it's just, that's what I like about it. I don't like the event. Like, I don't go for the event. Well, I go for the experience before the event. <laughs> I feel like if you if you decide you do that, you want to do that, you're almost guaranteed to break something. That's one of those events where if you have the vehicle that's capable in the first place, you're going to break something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Most people break. And then last year, uh, we went with a bunch of friends. And before the event, we were wheeling. I think it was like seven rigs. Yeah, I broke. Yeah. Everybody, it was really funny because we wheel into mm, there was no jeeps left. We wheel into it was like only one jeep that wasn't broke. But every day it's like okay, we have four jeeps left. Let's go, keep going. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> I broke my wheel 
in half. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. That, time. that hurt. <laughs> I've never. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. You broke your wheel yes. in half, yes. like just snapped it in half. Yes. Yeah. How does that happen? I don't know. That's what we said. <laughs> like somebody was like, hit, hit hit a couple boulders, and then you just heard everybody go, "Whoa!" And somebody was like, "The wheel broke," and I was like, "No way!" And I got out, and the whole the whole wheel had separated right down the middle, just cracked in half. Oh boy. Hey Ben, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no thanks. Uh, everything sounding good? Yeah, everything sounds great, man. Okay. Uh, we're. I'm just going to give it a hot second here. We'll see if uh, I'm going to ask Pope if they're going to join us or not, and uh, we'll get rolling. I appreciate you taking some time out. So cool. Hey Ben, how you doing? I'm Jason. Hey Jason, how are you? Uh, too bad. Uh, so are you guys uh, all in? Oh, say your name again. Lily. Lily. Yep. Okay. I have a daughter named Lillian, and we call her Lily. <laughs> At least nice. I do. Well, my name is Liliana, and people call me Liliana. Lily, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jason and Lily are out on the West Coast, uh, Washington State. It's called okay. Idaho. It's called Idaho or Washington State. I forget. Washington. Yeah. Okay. I was right the first time. Yeah. Um, Wait, but are you in a part of Washington that's basically Idaho? Like, are you in Spokane, or are you out on the coast? No, we're uh, just south of Tacoma area, so we're 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 west. Yeah, fair enough. And then, yeah, I'm uh, about an hour south of Denver, and um, just uh, north of Colorado Springs. Okay. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I'm in a little town called New Harmony in Utah. Mm. If you guys have ever come out to Sand Hollow. I'm about 30 minutes up north of Sand Hollow. Yeah, I've been there a few times. Yeah. These guys are the Sand Hollow experts, yeah. I would like to move there. It's not a bad place to live, actually. It's grown quite a bit. Hurricane and it, a lot of off-roaders have kind of moved there. Yeah. Yeah, it's like mo- every year I feel like we watch two or three more of our friends say, oh, we're moving, and they're in Sand Hollow. Yeah. A lot of the Californians out of the off-road community in California have relocated there now, like, that especially the ones who are like retiring and stuff. Yeah. And yeah, it's not a bad move. Especially when they're coming from California. Anywhere is better. Yeah. Well, and then in Utah, you kind of get this thing that people don't want the Californians coming here, but the ones that are coming to move to Sand Hollow are generally, they're the refugees. They're escaping the nonsense and generally have a good head on their shoulders. And yeah. yeah. Aren't going to bring the California with them for the most part. I've, for the most part, they see still the Californians are are great. We we live in a country of three hundred and fifty million plus people. You you can't avoid some of the moron. You just can't. As much as we all want to, like I I would like to not have stupid all the time, but I got to be a realistic at some point. I feel like anybody moving to Sand Hollow though is a purposeful move. So you probably get the Californians that are coming from a background in some type of off-roading so yeah they're definitely yeah. a different style than than the most california people that most people want to turn their heads to but i would want to get away from those gas prices that's for sure yeah they are we i was there gas. a little a few weeks ago it's like eight bucks a gallon in some places oh we had a we have there's a couple of gas stations by my day job office and they're in a gas price war, so they're down to two twenty five a gallon, and all I want to do is drive forty minutes to get it. Jeez. Yeah, the cheapest I can find diesel here is four dollars and seventy nine cents. And usually it's f- above five bucks a gallon just for diesel anywhere up here in Utah or in uh, Washington. It's still better than I've seen in some places. Uh, I agree. But like I think when we came back from Sand Hollow, it was so nice. With the prices of diesel, we knew we were back in Washington when we pulled into a gas station and it, it was like $5.79 a gallon. We're like, okay, yeah, that's just advertisement. We're back in Washington now. It's also the middle of nowhere and a lot of places between there. True, true. So. All right. Um, Pope and them are, and Pope and Randy are going to join us in just a minute. Uh, for some reason, they thought it was 730. Uh, so we'll just, we'll kind of get started because they were here last time. So they know what we talked about. Um, and we'll go through introductions with them as soon as they get here, Ben, just so you know who they are. Um, okay. so anyway, um, the last time we were here, um, the last episode that aired, uh, would have been our trail hero recap. Uh, Jason, you weren't here for like our official recap 
I did that with Pope and Randy. Uh, and that episode aired, and then I finally was able to get the two hours worth of our discussion with Sand Hollow 4x4 into a good two episode sprint that will run after our discussion with Ben. Um, so nothing too fantastic. And for anybody listening, that is the two episodes for our Sand Hollow discussion are basically one long episode that we're going to divide into two parts because two hours is a long time to listen to any of us yammer on. And um, while we think it's an engaging discussion, we realize people don't have two hour commutes. So um, check out both parts. They'll air after our discussion with Ben today. Um, and I, something I started last time um, on the show was I want to spotlight a company that is so a lot of folks in our sport think is for us and isn't. Uh, and the re, what made me think of this was a post that I saw of somebody that was very excited about a Patagonia hoodie that they were wearing. <clears throat> and all I could think of is, but the, the hoodie you're wearing is made by a bunch of people that don't want you to have the road that you took to get to where you took that picture. So Patagonia is one of those places, and I have to stand corrected uh, because I thought Columbia Sportswear might be a safe outfit. They are not. Um, they have some deep ties to some of those groups. Uh, and I was actually going to ask Ben if he might know somebody that uh, we could recommend as a outdoor as clothing. clothing outfit. Yeah, uh, Costco has a lot of good outdoor wear. <laughs> I mean, I'm good with Costco. Yeah, right here, right here. They, they probably stay out of most things. I don't. They, with push game to shove, I don't know which side they'd fall on. But I've been known to buy some outdoor doorsy things at Costco. And I feel like they try to be pretty agnostic. Yeah, there's off the grid is a clothing company that's kind of you'll see them around at off roading events, and they have lines of clothes that are pretty decent. And they um, climb is trying to get more into. Not just like the riding gear, but casual wear. And I told them, I'm like, you guys need to double down on this and do a lot more. Because, and so, I, I mean, it's kind of like what happened with Carhartt, some of these other brands that used to just be like truckers or ranchers or something. Now it's everybody wears them. So, well, yeah, they yeah, gave themselves the Hunter brand, right? Yeah. And, but now they're like the swaggy Gen Z bougie brand. <laughs> like everybody wears it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I don't. Right. At the end of the day, though, I think we we probably get too worried about Patagonia. If our industry is so much bigger, so much bigger than one clothing store, but then but they command the narrative and they command the agenda just because they've chosen to get in the fight. Uh, if one day that while I'm working for Blue Ribbon Coalition, I hope to be here during that day when the whole full force and strength of the off-road and power sports and motorized recreation industry shows up to these fights and we'll run the show. It's our, our industry is massively bigger than any clothing brand. We just need to start acting like it. I feel like, yeah, it's a, I feel that's a distributed situation. And to that end, I know that there's, uh, and Jason, did you have somebody you, I feel like you raised your hand. Oh no, I was just uh, repping Costco right here. That's like right there. I mean, Kirkland. There you go. No wrong with that. That's up here in Washington. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, uh, I mean, Costco, there's a number uh, these days, especially if you're on Instagram, there's a lot of uh, small businesses that are doing their, you know, local printing, uh, Goats Trail Company. And there's a couple of other ones that I, I know of off the top of my head. Uh, so, yeah, just, uh, I guess for me, it's just about choosing where to spend your dollar. Um, and, you know, if, if you're going to spend uh, money on something with a label on it, it, may as well not put it on somebody who's just fighting against your best interest. Yeah, I feel so. like uh, that's that's solid advice right there. Like me and Lily, like anytime we go to any event, we love just pouring whatever we do have into any of the off-road um, stands that are sitting up there. You, mean, you name it, from combat off-road to um, shit, like, like dirt. Dirt, dirt bag hats. Dirt there bag merchandise. Yep. Um, uh, what was the other one that we just went? Like Skull Hunter Four by Four. All those companies. They 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 love to give back to the industry and the community, and and I like supporting them. So, I would say that anybody listening to this, I would definitely encourage them to support all those. And I feel like the gift yeah. community is really good at supporting the small companies. Anyways, like I'm really amazed on like how many people go and buy 
from a small companies that are part of the offer of community then the bigger ones. So I think they do a really good job for what I've seen. I feel like it's gotten better in the last few years too. Yeah. I feel like people are spending more money internally within that network of smaller businesses and outfits that do that. Cool. All right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, we kind of <clears throat> talked about how you guys are doing. Um, Ben, how are you doing, man? <laughs> Everything good? Yeah. <laughs> Exhausted yet? Of, getting there. It's been a busy, we've probably been on full blast since about August. Um, cause we created that lost trails guidebook and we had a deadline. We wanted to reach on that, um, partly to fulfill a grant. And also cause we wanted the guidebook to be out in before any travel plans came out. And so we were working very aggressively to get that done in August. And then it came out in September. And that's when we kind of started hearing that it was becoming clear that this Moab plan was going to come out. So we've just been August, September, October, we're just continuous. And I, the Biden administration is really acting like an administration that's in its last year. They're just ramming through a lot of different things and it keeps us busy. Yeah, You want me to be bored. You don't, you don't want me to be having a full I, you, schedule. It's bad news if yeah. I'm not bored. I, I'm I, I, I've talked about it a couple times before, and I'll talk about it more. Like I'm, I'm a politics junkie. I'm some. My dad was a politician, and I'm somebody who's been wa watching it my whole life. And as even a person on a liberal side of the spectrum, I have never quite seen anything like the push that I've seen in the last year, year two years on this front. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a big deal. And but I appreciate you keeping the your foot on the gas, man. That's it. it it's good. It's a good moment to at least strike. So strike while the iron's hot. Well, it's got people's attention. Yeah. Oh, welcome. Hi guys. Sorry. We were late. I got my appointments crossed. I saw the appointment for next week and thought it was today. No, I was trying to so. move the next week one back. I did that to my wife too. I, maybe I should just wait before I send the next one out until after the invite. <laughs> yeah. So I apologize. I'll do that. It's I, not normally. I, I, I screwed my wife up too. Don't feel this. bad. All right. <laughs> um, so Pope, <laughs> Ben, Ben Pope. Um, hey, ben, nice to meet you. you? Yeah, Pope's out near Sand Hollow. You want to introduce yourself okay. real quick, and uh, we'll get back into it here. So, yeah, we uh, we actually live up in uh, South Jordan, and we love to wheel down in Sand Hollow. That's our favorite place. We'd probably consider that our second home. Uh, Moab is a, also very dear to our heart. It's one of the places where we learned how to do this in the first place. And uh, as as uh, new to, we're kind of new to the off-roading community, so it's kind of uh, shocking to see what's actually been going on that we've been ignoring is non-off-roaders. Yeah. And it's, it's actually impacts our lives now. So we, we're excited to be uh, yeah, part of the coalition and have you guys uh, on our podcast to talk about it. Yeah, we appreciate it. I always tell people a lot of the off-road communities that way is you get into this as a, as an escape. You want to get away from politics or church or the news or obligations or, but, and, and I have bad news for you. You've signed up for a political identity and it's one you're going to have to fight for. And it's not, it's kind of what you're tra probably trying to get away from. And that's why it's a little asymmetrical what we're doing with the environmental groups where it's really a religion and a church for them. And for us, it's our escape from church. And now they've turned it into something we're going to have to go fight for. And people are waking up though. They're realizing that those stakes are real. And if we don't mobilize together, they're going to shut everything down. They really are planning on it. So... Yeah. yeah, they definitely looks this this Moab uh activity definitely opens a lot of eyes. And there's the Grand Staircase of Escalani that's also a big area that they're trying to shut down tons of miles of OHV trails as well. Yeah. And it's kind of funny. It, it's like, worse it, it, than the Moab plan, the Grand Staircase. Yeah, it is. Like if you look at the worst yeah. version of that plan, <clears throat> it's way worse than the worst version of the Moab plan. And oh, I don't think red. people <laughs> Yeah, oh, people it, just it's, don't yeah, understand. It's just a sea of red. Mm -hmm. It's like having the state of Delaware have seven roads in it. I'll just we'll, I'll blow past this and then we'll we'll get into the meat of it uh, since everybody's here. Um, yeah. Jason, the last time you uh, when you weren't here, uh, I was telling Pope and uh, we got a phone number now. If you want to leave us a phone a message, you want to text us or somehow other, another other way to get a hold of us, uh, that is going to be one of the best ways to get hold. If you leave us a voicemail message, that is decent i will play it on the air and we'll we can all respond to it um, should we have I'd jason do blind reactions 
Well, you guys, I'll blind react you guys, but I got to, well, actually, no, I take that back. We're not live. I can, we can go ahead and play it live. You can edit it out. As, yeah, as Ben, pardon my French, but as, as a famous broadcaster said, you know, one said, fuck it, we'll do it live. Um, <laughs> all right. So we've got the phone number for you. If you want to leave a message or text us is 719-408-0132. You can always reach us at the trailheadnetwork.com and of course the trailhead podcast on Instagram. And uh, guys, uh, we all kind of had an informal introduction. Uh, ben, I want to read something. Feel free to let me know if any of this is false or if I'm wrong. Um, okay. But uh, I just kind of want to introduce you. Uh, guys, this is a ben, ben Burr. Ben's a man of many hats. He's out of New Harmony, Utah, a former Senate staffer, and he's now the executive director of the Blue Ribbon Coalition. It's a nonprofit championing respons responsible outdoor recreation on public lands. Uh, he's running, he also runs his own consulting business, helping ranchers and off-roaders navigate the complex world of public land management. Um, welcome, Ben. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. That's all, that's all truth. Hey, just said, yeah. I did some research. I didn't yeah. suck today. My, my English teachers would be so happy with me. All right. I can, I can confirm that. I used to teach English, and I appreciate that you did some research. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. At least it wasn't all for naught. Um, so you, uh, I don't, you probably didn't get a chance to listen to our other show because I assume you have other things that you guys are busy doing. But we did talk about the 317 miles of trails or, or miles of trails that were closed in Moab. Um, I know there's been a little bit of an update on that. Do you want to fill us in? Wait, they closed 317 miles of trails in Moab? I know, right? No, I'm just Big kidding. Shock. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> I did listen to some of the clips, like where you guys put these on Instagram as smaller clips. And so, cool, yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm aware of the discussion. We do have some updates. This last Monday was the deadline for filing the notice of appeal and a petition to stay to challenge it's kind of the first step of a legal challenge to this decision and we did that on monday we were partnered with the texas public policy foundations doing the legal work on that we have a uh they're one of their top attorneys is a member of our board now and so he's helping with that over at that organization and it's bringing a lot of additional resources and legal talent to this fight and so we're very happy with the appeal we filed we as we dug into this plan we kept finding more and more problems with it and not just that we didn't like it because we didn't but well, when yeah, you i think that's challenges, I think... you want to find that they did something wrong and that they didn't get their technical details right and that their analysis was faulty and and we it's the one of the worst plans i've seen as far as that goes we and we identified many of the initial technical errors we found so these are examples of they'll say route 1260 is is open and that means we can close route 1261 next to it but actually both routes are closed and right. there's just a lot of that where the technical analysis is just not accurate it tells me they rushed this through most likely i think they were getting political direction from washington dc to pass this which means it's a very poorly put together environmental analysis which really does expose it to the legal scrutiny we're giving it, it give, I think it increases the likelihood we could succeed in a challenge on these. And usually the usually these things are rigged in favor of the government, with the exception of, I think, our current Supreme Court has really changed a lot of that. And for a group like BRC to be teeing up legal challenges to these administrative decisions right now, there's probably not been a better time since the early 1900s to be really asking big legal questions about how our administrative agencies are functioning and whether they're following the laws correctly. And so we're, we're really grateful for all the support we've gotten from the community to give us the resources to just go at this with everything we've got. And that is what we're doing. Um, and that's, but that's what happened this week. We're waiting to hear back from the BLM. The next step is they'll give us the administrative record, which is more documentation than what we currently have from just reviewing the plan materials. Right. And that usually informs a follow-up legal argument where you're kind of laying out more broadly what you said on what we said on Monday, we will substantiate with more evidence and bolster the claims. And we have 30 days to do that. And then the BLM has the agency has 45 days to give some kind of response, at least to the petition to stay. And that's important because 
as long as that stay hasn't been ruled on, it, the plan technically shouldn't be in effect until we get a rule in that. So that means the trails, you could probably still use them. We've had people calling the BLM and the BLM's telling them, oh no, we think those trails are closed now. But then our attorneys look at the regulations are like, we don't know why they're saying that. It's and They're so, saying that because well, somebody has been told to tell them that. Yeah, it's just the agency. They're just used to being in charge and that it's a power move. And I mean, we. so I, was, I tell people, be careful. I, I wouldn't ride on a closed route out there. I'd document that it's closed and give it to us. So yeah. because if they're closing things already, that actually, I think, improves our legal standing and the urgency for them to issue the stay That's is that true. the agency is doing things that injure us now. And so I think they're, I think they're being cautious, but I think what you said, they're just saying it because well, they're being told I to. I think they'll be cautious where they think they have to be cautious. I mean, it's, it's something that we saw here in Colorado after the PSI lawsuit where they mm -hmm. just started bulldozing trails they thought nobody cared about. Um, and I mean, there's one here within 10 minutes of my house that is now closed. And I know the, it was closed immediately uh, after a ruling was made, but before it was stayed. And mm -hmm. no one ever knew enough to defend against it. So if you're listening to this podcast and you've got time between um, that ruling and any other decision, it's and as far as you know, according to you know Blue Ribbon Coalition and everybody else, it's still open. Go ahead and head out there. Um, document anything you see, especially if something's blocked off and you can't get to it. Don't violate anything. Don't confront anybody. But take some pictures and report it back. So Yeah. And SUA will go put sticks and logs and rocks and stuff in front of trails. And that's actually a criminal misdemeanor in Utah to illegally close a road, but they do it because it's hard. It's like a hard thing to monitor and catch somebody doing it. And so it creates the perception that, that it's closed. And we've, I've run into numerous routes where they're technically open according to our BLM travel plans and they look blocked off. And so people have stopped using them. Yeah, I had uh, a situation like that off Spring Canyon Point, one of the trails off of there that is now closed, um, mm -hmm. but was one of those trails beforehand that somebody probably just laid some sticks on it and then eventually enough people didn't use it where you almost couldn't see the tracks anymore. Yeah, so. and that's the game they play. I mean, we actually, in the previous plans I've been in with them as part of this big legal settlement we're in with them to do all these travel plans. I mean, in San Rafael Desert was... The area is across the river from this Labyrinth Rooms area. Yeah. The routes they closed, they said it was because we weren't using them. They were reclaiming. And that's why I started creating the Lost Trails Guidebook that we do um, to document the routes that they're saying that about. So people will go use them before they disappear. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah. It looks like we have had some people with copies of them, but that's we do. what informed that project. We don't, I never want to lose a route because they, they can actually legitimately argue we're not using it. No, and um, I'm done playing that game. If we want to talk about overuse or whatever that looks like, then I'll fight that fight too. But I'm not going to lose off of not using it because that's how we spread out the impact of these things is get more people in more places instead of getting them all in one place. Oh, hundred <laughs> uh, percent. That is, I, so I, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but I uh, write for trails off road and we were mm -hmm. at one of the expos and I was having a conversation with an older gentleman who was, very upset with what we were doing. And I told him, I'm like, look, man, these folks are, this was before COVID. These people are going to be out there. They're going to enjoy the public lands in some way, shape or form. We can either squeeze them closer and closer and closer together, or we can try to spread that out further and further apart and teach some good shoot stewardship in the process. And I don't know if he came away with the same thought process, but I think he understood where I was coming from on it. And I have long championed mapping every quarter mile of trail that we have out here in Colorado. And because we lost a lot of it, a lot yeah. of the PSI lawsuit was that same reason. Oh, they don't care about that quarter mile. They don't care about that quarter mile, but they take that quarter mile. And then the next time they sue, they look for another quarter mile until they don't have any quarter miles left. Yeah. And so we've got to start being a lot more intentional about exploring all the trails that are out there. I know a lot of people like to go just do the big name trails that are popular and you should, they're out there big and popular for a reason. I have not been disappointed a single time yet going and exploring the trails that nobody else was exploring. Yeah. Uh, I have every single one I've done is awesome. And it was, I don't regret a single one of them. And so, but maybe that's just what I like more is that kind of more exploratory type of outdoor recreation. Um, and people have their different preferences, but if you do like that, 
Matt, we definitely need people out there doing it, documenting it. When we have public comment periods about an area where you've been, you've really got to go say, hey, I went on this route and I loved it. I want to go back. Those kinds of, we did have a plan come out in Idaho this week. Um, we haven't done a release on it yet because we're still analyzing the details. But the overall first glance is that it was really good. They went with alternative D, which is the pro access alternative. And they added in like a whole, like a dozen more routes that us and the off-road groups in that area had asked for. And so they went to alternative D and then some in Idaho. And that's how it should work. That's And, and that's why everyone's so upset about Moab is because we did do that. There were so many comments in there with people talking about those routes and they just like basically tossed them in the garbage and didn't even incorporate the analysis into the plan of right. that the off-road users were using them. And so... So we need you to do it. And it's not like Moab was very political. We think it was Washington dictating what needed to happen. But usually when that's not what's happening, the local BLM managers will take good feedback and use it. So we need people out there using the trails is probably the most important thing you can do. And I think I saw on Blue Ribbon Coalition's Instagram this week something about when you make comments, you need to comment on specific trails, not just a generic uh, comment that says leave the trails open blah, 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 this isn't fair. Can you, can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So we do, when we ask for help with public comments, we have a form that people can fill out and that creates what's called a form comment. And the agencies generally don't like those. Uh, but my answer to that is this isn't for the agency as much. It's also for us to know what our community is thinking. And I've had to be the guy that has to go FOIA, what everybody said in their comments. And it takes, sometimes that takes a year to get that file and so the agency has all the intel. They know what everybody's saying about every trail. And I'm flying blind with the job of having to protect everything. So that's why we invest in these tools where we can see what comments people are making. And if I had to have you choose between making a form generic comment and no comment, you should still do that form generic comment. That's why we do it. But if you have on the ground personal knowledge of whatever it is we're commenting on, you should like erase what we wrote and put in your own stuff. That'll be a thousand times better. That's what we want to see as well. It helps us form and shape our comments. We use those in our legal arguments. That's usually who we'll go reach out to. Um, I mean, so you guys know we worked with Patrick McKay on our appeal with Colorado Off-Road Trail Defenders because he put together a really, really good comment. We consulted each with each other throughout that comment process. And so it helps us kind of see who's coming out of the woodwork with really good on the ground knowledge. Uh, you mentioned up front that I've done public land consulting. I got trained how to do it by a forest service supervisor. And he said, you can never really in influence a public land decision if you don't have on the ground knowledge. The second you go get that, you probably have the upper hand on most people in the agency because most of them don't get out on the ground. And so we really value the people with that on the ground experience. We try to go out to those areas ourselves. That's why this guidebook was a good strategy for us is it gave us grant funding to go out and actually inventory trails and do field work, see what's happening on the ground. And now I know the truth. I've seen what I've seen with my own two eyes and it does not match up with what the general public narrative is with what's going on with, especially this MOAP plan, but all other plans too. Once you've seen what's happening on the ground, you start to see where all the fake narratives are coming in and influencing this. And that's something I think we as a whole community need to work better at is getting that really substantive on the ground knowledge and using that to win our arguments on these things. And to get and to control the story. Jason, you got a question? Yeah. So um, Ben, just for, so say for example, you know, like me and Lily, we're up here in Washington. Um, we love, mm -hmm. we love Utah. We love all the trails. And, you know, as a, as a military veteran, um, I feel like I didn't spend most of my life trying to defend a lot of these things to just when I'm done with my military service, not to be able to enjoy the things that are here in the United States. Um, what, what, can, what can your average person do to support the Blue Ribbon Coalition? I, what, what is something from the smallest thing to the largest thing? What can we do to help? Yeah. So the smallest thing is... We want everybody to just become a member. We have all kinds of memberships. That could be as low as five bucks a month. We have an annual premium memberships, $50 a year. And then people kind of goes up from there. People donate. Uh, we do have our guidebooks right now and people can get a copy of the Lost Trails guidebook. We have offers out there where you can get the guidebook and it comes with a membership. 
And I'm dead serious about the guidebook that I want you to use it and go find these trails and know that I only put like 20, 30 trails in a guidebook. And for everyone I put in there, there's probably quite a few more, if not dozens more that are awesome. And you should go find those. I didn't give away the whole farm for a reason. Like there's dispersed camping coordinates in there. And I get some of the overlanders sometimes like, oh, you shouldn't share coordinates. I'm like, well, when you fight a lawsuit and lose because they say that nobody was using it, then I'll stop. As soon as they stop using that against me, I'll stop sharing coordinates. But for every yeah. coordinate I share, there's a hundred I didn't. Yep. And there's a lot out there you can go find. Um, we have like, so those are like the basic things of just what somebody who doesn't want to really dedicate a lot of time and effort into this. You just want to support us that are the professionals doing this. Um, that's helpful. But then the next step up, like that helps us financially. That helps us do this professional, our staff and our lawyers do what we need to do. But making those comments, that's free. And if if we were doing more of that, it's I think that's why this plan in Idaho was good is they didn't have we were the ones who showed up. And so they gave us what we asked for. And there's a we've commented on over 300 plans in the last year as an organization. We don't always solicit out the public to help us with those because some of them are relatively small. Like in Washington and Oregon, we have a lot of vegetation treatments where they're just trying to, where you've had forest fires, they want to go clear out the salvage trees or something like that. And you'll get Cascadia Wildlands Foundation or one of these environmental groups still litigate and try to prevent them from doing just cleanup work on a fire because they know if the agency can't get back in there and maintain that landscape, then the roads will erase and they'll disappear. And then they've laundered the roads out and they can turn it into a wilderness. And so in your own area, like whatever the areas are that you like to ride, we've done 300 actions in 29 states. There's a really good chance we've done something in your area but we tend to really publicize the ones where we know there's a lot of attention, where we know we're potentially going to go to a lawsuit. Um, and so if people wanted to get more into that policy work and you really wanted to dive into it, our policy directors always been willing to train people on a volunteer basis. And then if we found people that were good, I'd probably try to find a staff position for them in the long term. Um, but most people do it for like a week or two and they're like, oh my gosh, I have to read this 1200 page government. It's a very weird form of self-torture to want to go read these <laughs> planning documents and understand them and be able to analyze them to the point that you can, it really, it's like outsmarting the agency on these things who are, who it's their job to do these. And so we could use help with that, but at the very least go make your comments and especially add your personal stuff if you have it, but we need to be showing our force in numbers. Uh, that happened to us in Lake Powell. We had, they were managing they were changing how they managed the water at those reservoirs and got to a point where you couldn't even get your boats on the lake and things. So it was really impacting recreation. It cost the economy of page $200 million in two years that they couldn't get like, like the Lake Powell got too low and they wouldn't extend the boat ramps and all these things. And so that fired up that whole recreation community. And within 48 hours, we had thousands of people signing petitions and, and getting involved in the planning process there where before they had one comment. I went and did a document request on that. And there was one comment from the general public the last time they did their water management plans out of the Bureau of Reclamation. And now they're getting thousands from us. And and they take they they pay attention to us now. And they're moving somewhat in our direction. You don't always get everything you want out of agencies, but at least being there, they want they'll it does bend the process in your direction. And so that's helpful. Going up the scale from that is, I believe that our movement does a few things really well. We're very good at volunteer organizations. There's a, so many clubs and OHV organizations and Jeep clubs and stewardship volunteer projects that get done. And it's our, what, it's our, it's our strength. It's our hidden strength. It's our, and it, sometimes it's our most publicized strength. But when you've been in a courtroom with SUA and you look at their three staff attorneys and then their eight legal interns, knowing they're going to go out and work in all these other agencies and they're just professionally staffing that whole environmental movement, our industry hasn't done a good job of professionalizing this policy work. And that's one of the bigger visions I have for BRC is that we do have more people on our staff that are learning how to professionally do this, that go and work for legislators and government offices and have a really, I mean, my policy directors gotten requested for interviews to become legislative directors for members of Congress. She doesn't want to do it, but in two years we've trained her to be that good. 
And so we need to be sometimes you're best doing the most unwilling. Yeah. No, it's well, we want her here, but we should be using what we've got to train people that do want to climb that ladder. And then they become really helpful if you can place them in the Department of Interior somewhere or in a congressional office. And I worked in the Senate. Yeah. And you'd go try to recruit people to be the natural resource legislative aides. And basically you're pulling people out of like the oil and gas industry has talent that you can pull from or or you'll get a few lawyers and things that have kind of gotten into that space. But nobody's really coming in from outdoor recreation and off-road. Um, but we could. I mean, the, uh, the stuff we're doing is all... The, she goes in there and knows way more about what's going on than most of these congressional staffers do. And that's really valuable to an office like that. So we need... that's So as BRC continues to grow, I mean, those are the things I'll be investing in as staff attorneys, policy people, and then doing what we can to get our message out. And that's the other thing people can do for free. One thing I've seen happen just in the last four weeks with Moab is our social media accounts. We haven't changed a lot, but we are getting so much more traction there, um, getting people fired up and wanting to follow. And so to have, um, I mean, so people listening to this podcast, I told Tyler uh, Lawrence on from the Snail Trail podcast, I'm like, we should cut some of the sounds out of this and put them out on Instagram. And yeah. they did that and Trails Off Road, put one of those out there, got a million views. Uh, and so just getting this message out, people are waking up to it. They're fired up. So if people are influencers, if they have their own, I don't care how big or how small your account is on social media, this just needs to constantly be in people's feeds until we win. And that's going to take months or years. Yeah. And so you you can't just like tune out after the three weeks and we go into like the legal limbo of everybody analyzing arguments. We need to keep this fresh. And I will tell you there, the, this administration isn't going to let us get bored. Yeah. Um, I agree with Moab might like that, that continuous statement. I feel like even if we're to win the, the battle, we'll never win that war unless it's continuous. Like it, it, it's gotta be like in our community, we have to get the word out to make sure that people are constantly thinking about this. Otherwise, even when we're gone, our children are going to come up and they're going to want to explore the United States and see all these wonderful places. And it's not going to be there unless we continue to fight every battle to win the war. So it'll still be there. It just won't be accessible. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. It's, the land's not going anywhere. That's like the environmentalists are like, you're destroying the land. I'm like, nope, the land's fine. It's, <laughs> it's going to be there. <laughs> it'll be there long after we're gone. And, uh, and, and that was George... my point is I just, I want it to be accessible for everybody for, for, for as long as you can possibly imagine. There's so much greatness in this country and, and to try to keep it from people, it's just wrong. And as much as I, and I've said this before and I will say this again and I will pound on the table about it, as bad as this decision was in Moab, um, the good part about it, I feel like, is that it's at least given folks something to attach onto. So even if a, you know a year from now or six months from now we say, Hey, look, this is going on in Idaho, or this is going on in, say, Alabama or someplace else in the country. We can say what they're doing here is something that they wanted, like they did, wanted to do in Moab, and they succeeded. And if you if we sit on our laurels and don't do anything about it, uh, that's butts for children out there. Laurels is butts. Um, okay. If you sit on your butts and don't do anything about it, you're going to lose it. Um, so it's and then Jason to the other thing. We need to defend our ground as much as possible, um, but something that I have always kind of preached since I kind of started learning about <clears throat> land use issues here in Colorado is the future in trails and keeping our trails is not just litigation because we're already being sued as uh, off-roading entities and, and the rest of it, but in legislation and getting those. Uh, I saw the thing from <clears throat> Senator Mike Lee. Is, mm -hmm. And I, he's a pretty regular supporter of BRC and, and kind of the same goals, right? Uh, yeah, we have a lot of friend, a lot of folks in the legislature, in the Congress, who I think are pretty friendly to our point of view. <laughs> Senator Lee would be one of those. Most of the Utah delegation is going to be supportive of the positions we are adopting. Uh, and we have pockets of support elsewhere. I mean, we have uh, Congressman Bentz in Co Oregon's been good. There's a handful of good ones in California. Um, Idaho, generally, we can get to come on board if we get their ear. And Montana, I think I have, I've talked to Steve Dane's staff on a regular basis, and they're decent. 
uh, Wyoming is the powerhouse right now. I mean, John Barrasso is the head of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And just today, Congresswoman Hagman, she got a bill introduced to defund the resource management plan that's happening in Rock Springs. And what I was going to say to you about this Moab plan is, yeah, it is galvanizing people. And Moab is on everyone's mind, but I promise you it's also going to come to your own backyard. Uh, the Biden administration has one of his first executive orders was to enact the 30 by 30 agenda, which is a plan to lock up 30 percent of our lands and waters by 2030. And once they're done with that, they have a 40 by 40 agenda and a 50 by 50. And so they really want to lock up everything. And this is going to be a 20 year fight um, if we don't start taking it back. They'll just keep closing down more and more and more. So mm-hmm. while everyone's really fired up about Moab, if you were to go to Rock Springs, Wyoming, they'd be like, I don't even know what you're talking about with Moab. But everybody in Wyoming is talking about this Rock Springs plan because it is just shutting down everything in their state. The, What's the going on oil in Rock and Springs? Gas, or go ahead. It's a oh. 3 million acre resource management plan. And there, there are versions of this that basically make it so that Wyoming will no longer be producing coal and natural gas and oil which is oh. one of our top, and this is part of their climate agenda, and they're coming after it because they know they could never pass that legislatively. So they're doing it through this administrative process. And that's what's happening is these administrative processes are being weaponized into being a way to express the most radical versions of environmentalism. And that's why the Congress is like, enough. We've given you this authority, like this planning authority is something that got delegated from Congress. I would say that Congress should be doing something like a resource management plan. I think it's really stupid. They delegate all that authority away and they'll say, oh, well, we don't have the expertise. And I'm like, well, you guys have the power of the purse. You could hire, you you could, you wouldn't have to even spend new money. You could just take the money from the executive branch, give it to yourself. You have the expertise and then you vote on these plans. And if the people don't like it, you get voted out. You get That's to hire how our the government ex- was designed yeah. to work. Exactly. And so there's, you're starting to see Congress find strategies for taking this back because once you give that power to these agencies, they don't want to get it back. It's, they're unaccountable. They, don't, they can't be unelected, but they really are sensitive to their budgets. And so that's where the Lee bill is doing the same thing with all of these travel plans in Utah. It's defunding them. There's a bill to defund the planning efforts going on at Grand Staircase and what and what will likely be the Bears Ears plan will be just as bad as the staircase one. And But Wyoming, they got theirs passed into the Natural Resources Appropriations Bill, I believe it was yesterday or today. And that's if that gets put into one of these big spending packages that uh, government shut down or else, I don't yeah. think that Joe Biden's going to veto that over a defund of a BLM plan. I mean, it's just not high enough stakes nationally, politically. And so that's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of, good representatives that are working on these issues and we need to be supporting them. We need to be like in Utah, we have 200,000 registered OHVs. If all of them were calling the congressional delegation in Utah to support Mike Lee's bill, uh, they would be fighting really hard to get that into an appropriations bill. Yeah. Uh, if you live in Wyoming and you're not calling uh, representative Hegman to thank her for what she's done, um, and that they need to fight to keep that in whatever version of that bill comes back in the conference after it passes the Senate. I mean, they it's a lot of good resistance is happening at all levels on this stuff because they the other side is really overreaching. They really are trying to ram things through and abuse power. And the well, American and system does have end, checks on that. They don't always work, but we do have them and we need to push the buttons to make them work. Well, and yeah, I've long said that if we're going to start winning the, that the metaphorical fight, if you will, and got to start fighting that fire with fire. And that means finding people that want to do the legislative work and getting enough money so you can hire the lawyers to compete with the millions of dollars that organizations like SUA are spending on putting people on the ground. Um, or in this, I mean, one of the greatest things about our sport guys is that I feel like there's a such a distributed network of people that if we're brought together, we can, you know, get all the data that we need that these guys are paying people to collect and probably fudge and, you know, all the rest of it. These, these are all things that we can do if we just kind of circle the wagons and say, you know what, this isn't a side-by-side problem. This isn't a issue with, you know, forest fires. This isn't an issue with single track. It's not even an issue with horses. This is an 
issue with folks that want to close access to these roads, these areas. All right, kids, we're going to hit pause on today's chat, but don't think that we're leaving you at a dead end. We'll continue the conversation with Ben on the next episode, and you don't want to miss it. But you go out into Labyrinth Rims. I went out there with one of my staff members who hadn't been there before two weeks ago, and I'm like, I want you to count all the side-by-sides. Let's see how many we see today. Yeah. And it just turned into a joke. Like I was like, we were out there um, creating some content and looking, inventorying some of these sites, and I'd be like, shh, do you hear that? And he's like, he's like, what? I'm like, do you hear the side-by-side? He's like, is there really something? I'm like, no, I'm messing with you. There is no... Imagine this, losing 30 to 50% or more of our public lands and the future of our 4x4 freedom. We're talking about the big 30x30 agenda, and is it a green dream or trail riding nightmare? So the 30x30 agenda, people need to get very aware of what that is, and because they don't have like the legislative statutory mandate to enact this. It's just an executive order that basically said this marketing campaign we talk seriously about what our backcountry romps mean for old mother nature and about those empty cans and plastic wrappers that are left behind by all kinds of recreationists. We don't shy away from the messy stuff either. I found one thing that I'd consider to be trash and it was like one of those batteries, like a lithium battery connected to a disco ball strobe light thing. It's something that had been <laughs> lost in a drunken situation. And so somebody was out there having like baby Burning Man or something. I don't know. And <laughs> that was it. Like there isn't a lot of trash out in this area. And I and there are some impacts. I, I don't ever disagree that there are not some impacts. I just think they're over exaggerated. I, we even dip into how genetic engineering intersects with off roading. That's where we are with genetic engineering right now. Yeah. What if it explodes? Like what happened with information technology on screens? What if that what if that same explosion happens in the basic molecules of life? So don't go wandering too far. Tune in, turn up the volume, and let's continue this wild ride with Ben next week. It's more than just a chat. It's about fighting for the dirt-soaked, wheel-spinning, memory-making days out on the trails. That's what makes it so special. You get out in these places in the public land of the American West, and there are so many spectacular places. That's why people are so fired up about Moab, is you get to go stand on the edge of this thousand foot cliff and have this open, expansive view that goes on forever. Thanks for joining us on this episode. We'll see you next time at The Trailhead.